Just imagine, you are cruising at the speed of 2,000 km per hour at an altitude of 30,000 meters. That's almost 100,000 feet in a big plexiglass capsule strapped to a giant old Soviet fighter jet. A flight attendant comes by and offers you a glass of wine. What a view! Back in the early 2000s, this almost became a reality. My name is Clément Charpentreau and this is Aerotam Explains. Space flight is amazing, but very expensive. Launching a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket costs around 62 million US dollars, which is the price of approximately a million tickets on your favorite low-cost carrier. Or you could buy a second-hand Boeing 737 or an Airbus A320. While this might be pocket change for space agencies like NASA, the average adventurous citizen will have to spend their life savings several times over to experience a couple of seconds of weightlessness and the view of the blue marble below. There must be a better way. And there is. Instead of flying to actual space, you could climb to the altitude of 20 to 30 kilometers. There, the sky becomes black, Earth's curvature is clearly visible, and a slight dive down will make you weightless. The perfect illusion for flying in space without actually going there. Almost any old fighter jet can reach this altitude at a fraction of the cost of a space rocket. There are many companies now offering such thrills. They call this experience a flight to the edge of space. Between me and you, space actually starts three or four times higher. But why pay millions when you can have essentially the same experience for a few thousand dollars? This industry boomed in the late 1990s. After the Soviet Union collapsed and its military might crumbled, Western companies started organizing day trips that included a flight on a Su-27 or a MiG-25. What's not to like? But those flights were not without their problems. Old fighter jets are dangerous. Nobody actually died while flying to the edge of space, but some incidents did happen. Those flights were uncomfortable. A passenger had to remember countless safety procedures, sit in a cramped cockpit, and be ready to pull the ejection handle at any second. Not only was that dangerous, but it was also financially inefficient. A training version of a Sukhoi or a MiG will feature two seats, but one of those seats must be occupied by an actual trained fighter pilot. That means you have just one passenger per flight. And here is where the bus part of MiG bus comes in. Airbus came about in the 1970s as a conglomerate of various smaller European aircraft manufacturers. It became famous with the A300, the first wide-body twin-engine airliner. By 2019, it grew to be the largest aircraft manufacturer in the world. Just don't tell Boeing. In the 1990s, Airbus was not a company but a brand, and the company behind it, EADS, had lots of subsidiaries. One of those subsidiaries was Astrium, which later merged with other companies to become Airbus, Defense and Space. Astrium's main job was building and launching satellites. Odds are, if you've got one of these things on your house, you are watching television beam from an Astrium satellite. Space tourism was one of the areas Astrium wanted to explore. Age of space flights on old Soviet jets seemed like an easy way to do exactly that, but they wanted to make it safer, better, and just a touch fancier. So, two Astrium employees registered a peculiar patent called the Device for Supersonic Transport. It was a tube with a large plexiglass windows on top of a fighter. The patent shows that engineers at Astrium approached the project quite seriously. They considered various safety, controllability, and power issues. The tube would be detachable and could glide down using its own parachute if the jet had problems. Its large windows and comfortable interior would provide an unforgettable experience, at least on par with those many space cruises offer today. But all this weight and drag would also be a burden for any airplane, so a rocket motor would have to be added at the back or under the belly. Additionally, maneuvering in the thin air of a high altitude is difficult, Multi-axis thrusters, such as the one used by spacecraft, would have to be mounted on the nose of the jet. There would be two pilots in the aircraft. The capsule itself would carry between 4 and 12 passengers, plus a flight attendant. Smaller versions could be carried by fighter jets like the Sukhoi Su-27. But for the largest one, engineers wanted the most powerful jet there is, the MiG-31 a heavy interceptor that can reach the speed of Mach 3 and an altitude of over 25,000 meters. 
a further development of the famous MiG-25, the MiG-31 was still relatively new at the time and offered the biggest and most powerful platform for such a device. So, after all this work and investment, can we fly on the MiG bus today? In 2004, EADS published a report about the program. It was incredibly optimistic. The report confidently stated that no obstacles were preventing the company from building the MiG bus. It also reported that MiG was very enthusiastic. A scale model of a capsule had already been tested in a wind tunnel. However, it did not share the data of any tests with Airbus because flight characteristics of the MiG-31 were still classified. Despite well-known engineers working on the project and German aviation authorities being brought on board, one problem remained – funding. It appears there was a lack of financial support for MiG bus. The team could not attract enough money to actually build the prototype. We may never know why that happened. Maybe EADS did not take the project seriously enough to fund it. Or maybe it was deemed too expensive. All we can state for certain is that today the idea is no longer on the table. The patents expired long ago when Airbus stopped paying the relevant fees. And so the MiG bus faded into obscurity, condemned to aviation's innovation trash can by various challenges. Looking back on it now, we can only imagine how different things might have been had the right investment found its way to a MiG-31 fleet powering the MiG bus instead of carrying hypersonic missiles and wreaking destruction. We will never know, but space coasters would have provided a much better modern day reality. My name is Clément Charpentreau and you've been watching Aerotam Explains.